G'day Internet and welcome to River City Ransom Underground Underground. My name is Andrew Russell and I am the lead programmer on River City Ransom Underground. And in this show, I talk a little bit about some of the technical features in the River City Ransom Underground engine. Um, so today we are going to have a little look at uh, movers. So we've been talking a bit about um, how height maps work. And now if I come into the game and I bring up um, graphics display. So everything that is bounded with a box here, these uh, boxes uh, in Cyan, is a mover. And the Cyan ones are characters, the lime green ones. Now, uh, let me remember how to spawn a box. So uh, oh, they're just regular green. So the green ones, they're also movers, they're characters, so they don't locomote uh, on their own. So <clears throat> the way the physics system works in River City Ransom Underground is that um, <clears throat> everything that moves is uh, just a flat object and that is collided against the height map scene. So let me bring up the drawing system here and uh, with any luck today it will be on its very best behavior you may have remembered in the last couple of episodes we had problems with the tablet deciding that uh, it didn't want to be a tablet anymore it would like to be a mouse which obviously caused great deals of uh, issues so say we have a box in the game now, if this box doesn't move, if it just sits there being a box, this is enough. We have the height map, and then any character that comes along that wants to, like, for instance, stand on top of it, you know, it can it can do do collision queries with the um, height map that we've been talking about for the last couple of episodes, and uh, find out where that box is in space. And it can also, you know, it can collide from the side and so on. However, if that box would like to move itself, uh, or it'd like to be moved for any reason, it needs to be also declared as a mover. So it can have um, objects that are both uh, colliders and movers. And so it will define a sort of mover bounds, uh, which is typically the front face of the object. Um, in fact, yeah, actually, it will actually extend out to here, I believe, in game. So this whole area is the mover, and then it's got a center position here, which is where um, where the queries sort of uh, take place for its position. Um, and then characters, as, as we just demonstrated, have one of these two, and they're the same, the same thing. They just happen to get displayed in a different color just so you can easily identify where your characters are when you're looking at the debug displays. So this, both, both of these are essentially the same as far as physics is concerned. So, and the reason for this is it just makes um, collision queries and movement uh, so much simpler. So if we have, say, a box and a box, and we were to move the height maps then you've got the difficult problem and like the slow like it's um it takes a lot of a lot of cpu power to actually compare like this edge and this edge and then as it sweeps as they sweep towards each other you have to um figure out essentially like this is the volume of the motion here and say so they're both moving there's another volume here and do these do these volumes intersect? Uh, yes or no, depending on whether they collide, and that all just becomes very uh, difficult to deal with, and kind of slow. Uh, so what we do instead is we um, basically treat it as this um, this this sort of static thing. And so say we have two boxes coming towards each other at the start of the frame. Let me uh, let me try just fixing my diagram here. So okay, so these these 
we have at the start of the frame, we register all the height maps and they won't move for the rest of the frame. It's just assumed that the height maps uh, in the scene are static. And so say these boxes are coming towards each other. We first we say, well, all right, let's grab that one as the, um, I keep forgetting that the, uh, that this, that the um, mover box actually extends graphically all the way to the end of the object. I mean, it doesn't have to, but that's the default. So that's what most of the objects are. And so what it will do is it will then say, well, I'm, I'm a moving thing. I'm going to look at this edge and say, does this section here that's just moved that much, does that collide with just essentially what is there on the, um, uh, physics simulation. So if these were together, it would say, you know, if, if this one were over here further, it would say, yeah, look that if you move there, you'll run into this box. But because, uh, this is slightly further away, it won't run into the box. And then if this one's moving, so that one gets its chance to move and it moves. And then this one, when it goes ahead and does its movement, it will look here and it will, um, it will check where its box is moving this one there and it will look not at not at the uh, thing that has just moved there but it will still look at the height map from the start of the frame and that's sort of how we get the physics system working uh, robustly and quickly is we essentially register all of the uh, height maps of the physics objects at the start of the frame and then we do all of our movement and collision detection against that and resolve against that um, so let's have a look at that in game because the reason, the reason I've come over to the conveyor belt level, let me, I've run out of, run out of drink. <clears throat> so yes, as I've mentioned before, I, I record all these back to back cause it just makes life easier and, uh, gives me more sort of solid time for programming. So, um, yeah, so here we are, we've got our box and you can see, uh, if I put him down, there. So first of all, you'll see that if I want to place him down there, this is, this is like one of the weirdities of the engine that we just accept, uh, cause it makes life easier. And that is that is now, uh, going into the wall slightly, uh, with the, um, back of it. And most of the time that's not a problem. So if I were to come over to the conveyor belt, so the reason I'm on conveyor belt is I can show you, um, that if I put it down, on there, even though it kind of looks like the back of it's on the conveyor belt, it doesn't actually move because all of the movement is happening on this front edge. Whereas if I put it just here off the conveyor belt, it doesn't move. If I then go and put it here, it does move and into the pit it goes. Um, and so it's like that for all of the movers. And so some of these movers, um, like the uh, golf club, they just spawned there. Let's see if another get another one to spawn. In fact. Uh, why, why wait? Let's spawn a few baseballs. You'll notice that the conveyor belt, once it stops bouncing, we'll pick it up. Uh, I can spawn a baseball bat if I can, there, there it goes. So these ones don't have physics and so it's not a problem. Most if I spawn it off the edge, you know, obviously they stay completely still. And into the pit it goes. So that's, um, <clears throat> that's the situation with movers. There's one last thing that I want to show, and that is, let me see if I can do this. So this is where we go a little bit off script because I haven't actually tested this one yet. Let's see what happens if we spawn a crate inside the, um, I should at this point, I should at this point, um, say why the level is cyan rather than magenta. And that is, um, because it is actually magenta. It's just got a giant pit down here. So this is a pit level. And so the floor of the level needs to be slightly higher so we can go down to have a pit that things will fall into. So that being said, um, here's, here's a box. And let's say if I were to pause the game and try and spawn a crate inside that box. So there you'll see it's inside the box and I can tab off the thing. You can see that that is there. So the separation system after everything else runs, um, after everything else happens, run, and I think I can do it this way too. Yeah. Let's get rid of this crate. I don't like this one. Let's spawn another one using the debug tools. 
so it's paused and I can so that means I can edit the scene without any sort of uh, simulation causing changes and if I pop him inside that box so sort of inside the scene what will happen is a separational system will come along and say um, no that's you've, you've interpenetrated that into the geometry so I I'm going to accidentally spawn a car let's try again and I've started out that level now with um, combat. Oops. So if I now spawn this crate there, and I um, then unpause, you'll notice that as soon as I unpause it, it will come out of the um, out of the uh, location where it finds itself. So let's get rid of that and um, do that again. So if I spawn it um, just straight up. It doesn't, it doesn't have time to display. You'll notice, again, that um, even though it's sitting sort of kind of inside those things, just uh, by the fact it projects backwards, it's moving section is the green box is outside and I can kick it off and it doesn't have a problem. Whoops, if I kick a box and it ricochets, then I get hurt. Um, so just to, just to finish up and draw that out, um, yeah, so the separation system will go through and say, you know, here's the here's the level, and um, if you put if you put if you go and stick something in to the wall, and that could be anything. You could pick up an object and stick it into the wall, or you could have a character and I started drawing with the game up. That's cool. So, okay, let's say that again. So we've got this level here. Um, here we go. So we have this level here. <clears throat> and if somehow a box or a character or any other objects get put inside this wall, the separational system will come through and will say, yeah, that's not, that's not allowable there. So what it will do is it will just find the closest position it can place it in and um, it will move it to that position to make sure that nothing stays in the wall. And the reason, sort of, <clears throat> the main reason we do that is to ensure that, um, ensure that you don't get stuck. Uh, because once you find yourself in a wall, once one of, the, once one of these movers finds themselves within a, within a wall, uh, if it does this query here, um, this one here, it will look at this and say, I want to move there, that way, and it'll say, well, no, that's inside a wall, so you don't move. And so then you try and get out this way, it's like you're trying to move here, and it'll say, no, that's inside a wall, you can't move. And so you end up with objects that get stuck. So we have a, we have a separate pass that just tries to free those objects. now. There's another layer to that, and that is if you've got a mover, so we have a crate, it's got some crate, it's got some physics volume to it, uh, so it's got some collision and it's also got some mover, um, moverness to it. And say, say some, some cheeky character was is sort of really cheeky character went and placed that object inside you. So uh, poor unsuspecting fellow is standing here. Um, and he's, he's sad because he's been created. And so when uh, his, his um, physics comes around and he wants to get out of that crate, if we didn't do separation, uh, sorry, well, okay, so this situation is a bit different because the crate moves, so I'm off track. So, you know, if we didn't didn't recover from this situation, he'd query, uh, you know, he'd query this edge and be like, I'm trying to move here, and it would fail. And if he was further, far enough inside the crate to try and query this edge, and he couldn't move either of those ways, those would be, those would be unavailable. But we want them to be available. So in this situation, where it's not the level, like this, but where it's a um, mover, so a, a moving object that has a 
moving system here and I mean you can you can there is actually functionality in the engine to customize this slightly um, like you can toggle it but this, these are the defaults uh, what we do is while this guy we register every object in the physics and while this guy starts the frame inside this object he's not collided with it he ignores the um, he ignores the crate that he's standing inside of so let's quickly go and jump into the jump into the game and try and demonstrate this so here's Alex and here's here's Glenn and he's gonna pick up this crate and he's gonna go and pop it inside Alex and as you can see Alex can just cruise on out of there uh, let's do that again so Glenn get out of the way and you'll notice that um, so Alex can then say let's say to make this really obvious let's say Alex uh, jumps so he jumps and now he's on top of the crate now he's colliding with the crate and so you'll see there he collides with it there and he ran into it <clears throat> uh, but while he was in the crate he can just walk through it and so this also works for things that move so if I create a whole bunch of crates inside each other you know this is not a problem and then this is gonna this is gonna be interesting let's let's see what happens if I kick this this is just this is just for fun now so it ricochets and it hits him let's refill his health so eventually and then once they're free from each other so uh, get rid of that um, once they're free from each other they will actually collide with each other so that's sort of how the mover system works and how it interacts with the uh, how it interacts with the um, collision system Whoops. so that's it for this episode of River City Ransom Underground Underground uh, if you would like to follow along you can follow my blog at andrewrussell.net you can follow me on Twitter at underscore Andrew Russell. you can subscribe to me on YouTube um, which will be where you have probably already watched this video so just click through to that and if you'd like to follow along with the game and get retweets of um, River City Ransom Underground Underground you can follow at River City Ransom on Twitter thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time